All right, hello. It's uh, K.V. Johansson here doing a, another thing. Oh, and there's Ivan fleeing because I'm talking to myself. The famous Mr. Wicked. He doesn't really put up with strangeness like humans sitting and talking to themselves. So as I was saying, <laughs> doing another video for the super relaxed fantasy club because you guys are all in lockdown over there again. Here in Canada, things are not, in my part of Canada, I should say, things are not quite so dire. Uh, New Brunswick's doing pretty well, really. Partly because we're a bit of a backwater. So I was going to talk about music this time, and music and writing. Um, I've always kind of realized, well, I, I've realized I've always kind of uh, stuck musicians into my books. Um, Rook Feather and the Tory books, and and Moth, and Day and Dara, uh, who else? Well, various people in other books, but this idea of, of music and storytelling kind of going together seems to get into things a lot for me. And um, I also really have to have music on when I'm working. I have trouble concentrating if I don't have something playing. My, and that would be Ivan the Wicked barking because I'm talking to myself. He's greatly concerned about this sort of thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry about that. So, so I think my, my, my theory anyway is that music of a certain complexity kind of occupies the really fidgety bits of the brain that are almost a distraction when you're writing. So if they've got some nice sort of thick layered music to listen to, um, they can kind of like shut up and let the other parts of your brain that are sort of creating the actual story, because I don't really know what's going on until I'm actually writing it. They can let those bits go on on their own. And I'm going to try and pause this to go and see what the dog is so noisy about. All right, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, yes, music. So, I've, uh, yes, music to keep you from sitting and fidgeting and going on Twitter too much. And we all know I, I never go on Twitter when I'm writing. No, never. Um, but find, having the right music cuts down on that. But the right music kind of changes. And <clears throat> I used to write a lot listening to folk music and classical music, quite a lot of classical music for quite a long time. Uh, but when I was writing Black Dog, this is Black Dog. When I was writing Black Dog, I began switching to Solitude CDs, which are um, instrumental music with a lot of water and birdsong recorded by um, uh, there was a producer named Dan Gibson. And he did all the Solitudes albums with a bunch of different composers. Uh, there's a lot of imitations of that kind of thing that are quite schlocky, but uh, Dan Gibson's Solitudes were really, um, really good music to write to at that point in my life. And I still play them when I'm kind of needing to de-stress and stuff. And I also listened to a lot of Lorena McKennett while writing Black Dog. She's a Canadian harpist and singer and, um, uh, does some traditional folk stuff and other other things, original compositions, uh, poetry set to music. And the two albums I listened to most for Black Dog were An Ancient Muse and Book of Secrets. And I think um, they kind of complemented in a way the, the there, there's some songs on those albums. If you, if you give them a listen, they, they really complemented the book. But by the time I was writing The Leopard and the Lady, I started to slide over into more of the uh, rock and pop of my teenagerhood. And I was listening to an awful lot of Pet Shop Boys and Queen, which um, some people might find a peculiar combination and also something a bit more difficult to write to, uh, given the sort of the... Uh, well, lyrics that you need to listen to. But I, I found it 
was sort of really what kept my mind going. So there's the leopard and the lady, written mostly to Pet Shop Boys and Queen. And Pet Shop Boys and Queen are something I'm, I still fall back on quite frequently when writing. Uh, by Gods of Naban, stole lots of Queen and Pet Shop Boys, and I was buying more albums. And then um, a lot of uh, folk metal started to get into the mix. So some people recommended various things to me. And so I bought some albums by Tyr and Metzatol and you know, uh, Mirath, it's another one, and various things like that, uh, Nordman. So I was listening to those as well and made sort of a playlist of those that played right through. The one thing I find when I'm listening to music is I really prefer to listen to an album, like a whole album, and in the order it was recorded in, because usually that's been put together with some kind of pattern and structure to it. And I find the sort of jumping around random shuffle thing kind of stresses me if I know the album. And, but if I don't know the album, then if it's a new album and stuff, I can't work while listening to it anyway. It's got to be something I've listened to a few times before I can work. And then for The Last Road, there is The Last Road, uh, had um, Iron Maiden joining Queen in the lineup and Dire Straits, Johnny Marr, some, some very guitar heavy things, in part because I was thinking a lot about a different uh, book that I'll talk about in a minute that was is a very guitar heavy book because uh, I play guitar and bass and badly, very badly, but I do. Uh, and so that's what I was listening to then for The Last Road. And um, yeah, Iron Maiden's still something, and Bruce Dickinson, this still something that's in my mix for writing quite a lot. Some, that kind of have some complexity to them and multiple layers and lyrics that have some some bones to them, some content, some sort of solidity, not just uh, fluff, some poetry to them, I guess. And the whole music thing, I started to write, well, I sort of had this idea that came into my head, bang, like that, all about music. And it was a just a contemporary lit novel about two guys, one summer, summer of 2016, which of course in Canada was a summer of music because that was uh, the Tragically Hip's last tour. And uh, one, one of the guys in the book is a rock musician, an up and coming rock musician. The book was, or is, Love Rock Compost, which I wrote under another name, uh, Chris Jameson, just so that people wouldn't be expecting uh, you know, demons, shapeshifters, sword fights, you know, politics. Trump gets a tiny mention, but it was the summer of 2016. Um, so it's a very, I don't know, comforting book to read. I find it a comforting book to read. And it's all about music. And of course, I, hey, you can even see the back. I, um, listened to, while I was writing it, I listened to a lot of the music that the characters in the book talk about. Uh, obviously not the stuff that I made up, because I had to make up a few bands as well, but all the real ones. Listened to a lot of those and did make a little playlist for it, and I know I've promised to make a longer one that will cover all the music mentioned in it, but I haven't got around to that yet. So. The last thing to mention, I think, is this, which is The Storyteller. And this was written at the same time as Black Dog. It's a collection of four short stories written over various points of time. I mean, uh, but the, the story, the storyteller that's in it, actually is part of Gods of the Caravan Road. It's a foretale to Black Dog. And it's about Moth and Mickey uh, and how they started off on their travels and the first devil that they were hunting down. And at this point, Moth is traveling as a storyteller, not as a singer, uh, although she does play the harp and that is mentioned and in at other points in it. And I thought I could read you just the start of 
of the storyteller, which is all about stories and music and things like that. The storyteller and her giant of a man came to the great wooden hull at Elves' Nest when the last light, when the last red light had faded from the roofs. She didn't look to be a scald, butterfly bright, to show how lords had rewarded her. No gold at wrist and throat, no scrap of eastern silk. Her undyed tunic was over large and rolled up at the sleeves. Her dark trousers patched at the knees. Even her long braid was the color of bleached autumn grass. She was a drab moth of a woman, and standing in the porch where guests would leave their weapons. That was the name she gave the door warden. Moth, a storyteller from far away. Young Ulfleif reached the porch in time to hear this and stopped dead in her headlong rush. Something about the stranger prickled her spine. Maybe it was that she had a look of the last queen, the grandmother Ulf barely remembered, who had either defied fate or served some grim foreknowledge to name her Ulfleif, Wolf's heir. Ulfleif was late coming to the hall because she had taken her lyre up to the peak of the Merensbjorg to spend an afternoon with the god who had watched the lands about long before the first king, Ulfleif's ancestor, came with his dragon-proud ships out of the drowned west. The god Merton had been in a fey mood, telling Ulfleif, not for the first time that summer, that there were hidden powers come into the land, creeping dangers beyond Merton's strength to clearly see or oppose, and that Ulfleif should warn the queen, who never bothered to climb the god's crag. Ragnvor the queen would only laugh at her and tell her that since the death of their uncle, who had been their father's sword, and then Ragnvor's, Ulfleif could not afford to be a little girl, fretting over what maybes. Ulfleif had gotten Martin, telling tales of the days before the coming of Ravenmode the Wise, stories of demons and gods, and the little first folk who still lived on the high fells. They both forgot the warnings, or pretended they had, trying to shape one of the tales into a new song. Why not? Neither of them had the power to escape whatever doom stalked Ulf's nest, or the fates that bound them to it. The gods of the high places were born of the land and watched over it, but they could not direct the affairs of their folk. When the folk chose to ignore them, there was little they could do. Ulfleif, who would have been a scald, was doomed by birth to carry an ill-omened sword, and probably to die in battle, as nearly every man and woman cursed with that sword had. It made a good story, but she would rather have been the scald chanting it. Ulf dodged past the strangers, but had to stop to hitch at Kepra, as the sword, still too large for her, snagged on the doorpost. She was skilled, for her age, with any other blade, but Kepra thwarted her even in little things, and in her haste she'd gone and left her lyre on the Martinsbjorg for the dew to warp. The door warden sniggered. Ulfleif glanced up into the storyteller's sea-gray eyes and froze. Not a mere chance resemblance in the bones, it was like staring into her sister's silver mirror. Her own eyes, her grandmother's, some bastard kin come home? The storyteller had to see it, too. Who are you? she demanded, as though she had every right to make demands of a princess in her sister's hall. The woman's gaze slid to Kepra's garnet-studded hilt. Her man touched her shoulder, reminder of courtesies a storyteller ought to know. She bowed then. I'm called Moth. This is Mickey. Ulfleif Regan's daughter, Ulf said, wondering. Moth who? Mickey of where? She eyed Mickey, whose head brushed the lintel of the door. He was an evident foreigner, with his moon-pale skin and eyes black as sea coal, though his unkempt hair and beard were barley gold. Ulfleif had taken him for the storyteller's servant, even a bondman, barefoot and dressed in nothing but an unbelted tunic. That hand on the shoulder was not a servant's gesture, though, and it was Moth, not Mickey, who carried the one bundle. A sword, wrapped in dark cloth and tucked under her arm, but it had the length. How had the door warden missed it? Moth gave her the merest shake of the head and a wry smile that was hardly there, and Ulfleif swallowed her protest unspoken. Ulfleif, the queen's sword, the hallmaster corrected, coming to greet the strangers as Ulfleif edged away. Ah, the storyteller said, and as if it answered much. The queen's sword, with the sword of the queen's sword. Ulfleif fled, though there was no hint of mockery in Moth's voice. To be the king's or the queen's sword, the elder sibling's champion, was the second child's doom in their family, tradition that had come over the sea with Ravenmode the Wise. It was hardly her fault she came to it so young, a girl not yet a woman, but they all made a joke of her. When they did not whisper, she was fated by her very name for treachery. Your knees are torn, Ragnvor reproved Ulfleif when she reached the dais. Were you up to see Martin again? You shouldn't pester the god like that. Climbing, said Ulfleif, builds muscle. Ragnvor nodded, barely listening, and turned her attention back to her wizard, handsome, charming, red-haired Yorthus, who, some muttered, had his mind set on being more than wizard to the queen. 
the orthos gave Olflaif a sympathetic wink. A storyteller's come, Olflaif offered. Ragenvor nodded again. Olflaif sighed. Yorthus was in the low-backed chair that should be hers by the queen's high seat. Rather than squeezing onto a lower bench or drawing attention to herself by sending someone for a stool, Wolfleif took bread and a wooden platter of pork and kale from the table and leaned against the wall behind her sister's seat. The place of the queen's sword was watching. She would watch, since it seemed door warden, hallmaster, and even the warriors who were the queen's hearth swords were failing to do so. Ulfleif watched as the hallmaster showed Moth and her man to a seat on the bench along the wall. The fire flared between them, but she saw Moth watching her in turn. She knew the woman, deep in the heart, in that place where she had to bury all the songs, but that did not mean she was going to completely ignore the fact a stranger had brought a sword into the hall. Oh, sit down, Ragenvor said, noticing Ulfleif's stance. I don't expect you to save me from enemies today, little sister. Ragenvor's own sword leaned on the arm of her chair. And if any enemies stormed the hall, it would be Ragenvor defending Ulfleif, while the queen's sword tripped over Kepra and dropped it on her toe. Ulfleif shrugged and stayed where she was. Ragenvor laughed and settled back to her meal, sharing her drinking horn with Yorthus. The storyteller watched the high table across the flames, and Ulfleif frowned at the red glow reflected in her eyes. Her man's flashed green. Ulfleif rubbed her own. Salt driftwood in the fire. Green and blue danced on the edges of the flames. While her sister's glee man sang old songs in different well in a cracked voice, never varying from his last rendering, likely not from the one forty years before, Ulfleif amused herself guessing what sort of tales the storyteller brought. Peasant tales if her clothes were any guide, cunning shepherds and earthy demons. Her accent was careful and somewhat strange to the ear, but more suited to a lady than a laborer. New romances from the south, full of overmannered maidens and anguished lovers? She rather thought not. Moth was northern, even if her tongue would not let Ulfleif name the exact bay or high dale. Old familiar tales of the north, with the flavor of some other king's folk, she decided, and prepared to enjoy herself. When the trestle tables were cleared away and the servants circled with brimming jugs, the hallmaster brought the storyteller forward and gave her name to the queen. Moth didn't stand form form formally before the hall, before the queen. She sat herself uninvited on the edge of the long central hearth, that distrusted bundle by her foot. People whispered, even laughed, peasant manners. But as she spoke, it might have been for the queen alone, or for Ulfleif. Her voice reeled in all the folk of the hall to her. The glee man, skilled in that at least, threw out careful notes from his harp to fall among Moth's words, bright as silver, dark as midnight forest. But Ulfleif could have chanted the words herself, the merest babe in the hall could. Long ago, in the days of the first kings in the north, there were seven devils escaped from the cold hells, where the old great gods had sealed them after the great war in the heavens. And in the days of the first kings in the north, there were seven wizards. These wizards were wise and powerful. They knew the runes and the secret names and the patterns of the living world and of the dead. But the seven wizards desired to know yet more and see yet more and to live forever like the gods of the high places and the goddesses of the waters and the demons of the forest and the stone and the sand and the grass. Now the devils, having no place, had no bodies, but were like smoke or like a flame and not of the earth at all. Some folk even call them kin to the old great gods, though this is heresy, of course, said the storyteller, the which statement her voice mocked, Ulfleif could not decide. And these seven devils, who had escaped the cold hells, hungered to be of the stuff of the world, as the gods and the goddesses and the demons of the earth may be at will, and as men and women are, whether they will or no. But they did not desire loving worship and the friendship of living men and women, as do the gods of the high places and the goddesses of the waters. They did not watch and judge and cherish the souls of human folk after death, as the great gods are said to do. Was she some philosophical heretic of the Far East, to add, are said to? in the land beyond the stars. The devils craved dominion as the desert craves water, and they knew neither love, nor justice, nor mercy. They made a bargain with the seven wizards that they would join their souls to the wizard's souls and share the wizard's bodies, sharing knowledge and an un un unending life and power. But, so the story goes, Moth added, the devils deceived the wizards and betrayed them. The devils took the souls of the wizards into their own and became one with them and devoured them. They walked as wizards among the wizards and destroyed those who would not obey or who counseled against their counsel. They desired the homage of kings and the enslavement of the folk, and they were never sated, as the desert is never sated with rain. 
they would have ruled the earth and the folk of the earth and its gods and its goddesses. They would have devoured the spirit of the living earth and turned the strength of the earth against the old great gods in their heaven. So the kings of the north and the tribes of the grass and those wizards whom the devils had not yet slain pretended submission and plotted in secret, and they rose up against the tyranny of the devils and overthrew them. But the devils were devils, even in human bodies, and not easily slain. Only with the help of the old great gods were they bound, one by one, and imprisoned in stone, in water, in earth, in the heart of a flame, in the youngest of rivers, in the oldest of trees, in the breath of a burning mountain, as all the stories say. And they were guarded by demons and goddesses and gods. And the old great gods withdrew from the world again to await the souls of human folk in the heavens beyond the stars. That preamble should have taken them into one of the many stories of the War of the Seven Devils, which everyone knew. But the storyteller pulled them into another tale, not one of the usual cycle, weaving new words into the old pattern. Ulflaith, on the first name, shook her head, not wanting to hear again of her namesake's shame and treachery, and warning against telling it here, under this roof, where Ravenmode King died betrayed. Moth saw the warning. Ulflaith knew she did, but she went on speaking. Mickey, though, rose and disappeared into the darkness of the porch. In the days of the first kings in the north, said the storyteller, there was a woman named Ulfhild, the king's sword. And that is where it all begins. So I think that's it for this video. Um, stay safe. Look after yourselves. Goodbye from New Brunswick.